Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX14 Walsh and welcome to an all new Ace in the Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode I shall be reviewing the Spitfire Mark V B, a tier 3 battle rating 4.0 British fighter. As always starting with the plane's history, as I have previously provided an overview of the history behind the Mark V variant of the Supermarine Spitfire as may be seen in my review of the Mark V C variant, link available in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now. Today I shall be focusing specifically on the Mark V B variant of the Supermarine Spitfire. We begin thus. Upon entering production in March 1941, the production of the Mark V was split between the Mark V A and the Mark V B sub variants, with the Mark V B quickly becoming the main production sub variant of the Mark V. In terms of design, the Mark V B was effectively an upgraded Mark I, whereby the main changes included the original Rolls Royce Merlin III, 1030 horsepower liquid cooled V12 engine, being replaced with the Merlin 45. 1440 horsepower engine, which incorporated a new single speed, single stage supercharger, refinements to the engine carburetors, which enabled the Spitfire to use negative G maneuvers without impacting the engine's fuel flow, and the introduction of the Type B wing as standard, which allowed the plane to field four 7.7 litre Browning machine guns and two 20mm Hispano Mark II cannon for its armament. As production of the 3911 Mark V aircraft progressed, numerous modifications were made to the design. These included, but were not limited to, the fitting of a larger oil cooler under the port wing compared to that of the Mark I, the use of a blown cockpit hood to increase the pilot's headroom and visibility, and the fitting of a gun heater intensifier system as fitted the exhaust stacks in order to send heated air into the gun bays to keep the armament warm. The Mark V B also became the first Spitfire sub variant to carry the specially designed slipper drop tanks as mounted underneath the centre section of the wing. To accommodate these drop tanks, sets of small hooks were fitted just forward of the inboard flaps, meaning that when the drop tank was released, these hooks would catch the trailing edge of the drop tank, swinging it clear of the plane's fuselage. Upon its introduction into combat service in the summer of 1941, the Mark V-B's main adversary would be the Messerschmitt Bf109F in the skies over Europe, with the planes proving to be the equal of one another. This was to change with the arrival of the Focke-Wulf 190A1 in August of 1941, which proved superior in most regards except turn circle. In an attempt to overcome this new threat, whilst the Mark 9 variant was being developed, a low altitude fighter sub variant of the Mark 5B was produced. This led to the RAF, i.e. the Royal Air Force, introducing the F or fighter and LF or low altitude fighter designations, with the low altitude Mark 5B being designated the LF Mark 5B and the original Mark 5Bs being redesignated as F Mark 5B. The LF Mark 5B differed from its fighter counterpart through two main changes. Number one, the usage of clipped wing tips to improve the plane's roll rate and increase its airspeed at lower altitudes, making the Mark V be the first Spitfire sub variant to see the usage of clipped wings. And number two, the replacement of the Merlin 45 engine with either the Merlin 45M or Merlin 50M 1585 horsepower engine, which had been optimised for low altitude performance. The Mark V B would also be the first Spitfire sub variant to serve overseas, with 15 planes being deployed to Malta from the aircraft carrier HMS Eagle as part of Operation Spotter on the 7th of March 1942. The Mark V B was also deployed in the North African theatre as the tropicalised Mark V B Trop sub variant in May of 1942. This plane featured a Vox air filter as fitted under the nose as part of its tropicalisation, which reduced the plane's performance to a minor degree. The Spitfire Mark V B started being replaced on the production lines by the Mark IX variant as of June 1942. For clarity, the Mark V B sub variant as shown on screen today represents the F Mark V B sub variant and reflects the initial Mark V B aircraft produced prior to the arrival of the Focke Wulf 190 A1. And so, have our historic review concluded, let us take a look at how the Spitfire Mark V B handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the ground strike map Iron Range. This will be used in the following setup. Trace develops for our machine guns, the reasoning being twofold. Firstly, the 50 50 split of armour pierced incendiary and incendiary tracer rounds means we have a good chance of setting fires on our foes, particularly the armour pierced incendiary rounds which can get through the armour and into the fuel tanks. Reason number two is that the incendiary tracer rounds give us the ability to range in our 20mm cannon on long distance foes, i.e., bombers that are trying to fly away from us and use their armour in defensive nature in order to push us away. Distances of 800 meters or more mean that we do not have the lead indicator and instead we need to rely on our machine guns in order to range in the target, thereby not expending our limited of ammo capacity on our 20mm cannon of only 60 rounds per cannon. Then when we see the rounds are striking the target, we can open fire of our cannon to maximum effect. If you're looking for a more damage orientated build, however, I recommend going for the stealth belt machine guns. 
what are the ratio of two armor piercing sentry rounds to a single incendiary round, you'll have the higher overall ability to set fires on foes and the greater damage output over time. Prior to winter millimeter cannon, we're taking the air target belt, which in my experience is the most powerful out of those available. And as for our gun convergence, which affects all of our armor because it's all based in the wings, we have it set to 400 meters, which is focused primarily on turn fighting, but also adds in some flexibility for shorter distance boom and zoom strikes on foes out to a distance of say 650 meters, and we'll exhibit that a little bit later on. As for our fuel load for the final time of 2018, we're going to be running the 30 minute setting to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscathed on fuel capacity. Starting off our review then, as always, by comparing the plane's climb rate to that of its aggressors and opponents, what you'll find is that the climb rate of the Spitfire Mark 5B is good when looked at in isolation, but compared to its battery rate and contemporaries, it lacks the climb angle sustainability. With the Tycoon 100 D1 coming charging towards us here, we're swinging side to side in order to cause them to not have a clean shot on us in a head to head, and our ally and the Spitfire Mark 5B off to our lower port side was able to pick them off for their first kill. And now we go after the Messerschmitt 109F in the distance, most likely in F4. As we go after this foe, what we reflect on is the fact that the climb rate of the Spitfire Mark 5B does not have the ability to sustain its climb at an angle of say 22.5 to 25 degrees, instead achieving this only at a 20 degree angle or less through more emergency power cycling, my typical method. And the net result of this is that whereas the foes that we just mentioned will be able to get to 5,000 meters in a given period of time, you'll be at an altitude of say 4,250 to 4,500 meters in the same time period. Giving these opponents the initiative in the first instance, they will win the climb race and therefore they can dictate the next rule of the engagement, i.e. when they wish to strike you. So instead you have to enter this reactive position, getting ready to return favour on the foe as they try to dive down on you, you'll reverse the engagement and then shoot them in the rear. This can be a little bit frustrating for those who like to control engagements, i.e. pick when they're going to attack their foe because they're going to be at the whim now of when their opponent is going to attack them and anticipating it. And here you'll see I'm getting ready to reverse the engagement against the Messerschmitt 119. I'm getting ready to go into a split S here to cause their dive to become more extended. So that way they build up additional speed than they're perhaps anticipating, causing their control surfaces to lock up more heavily, particularly their roll rate, which will cause them to overshoot. But they've gone for the safety option here of just breaking up and away, which is an alternative option to avoid the concept of overshooting the foe. So because you have the altitude to your advantage, so therefore you can play it safe. Now we are considering going after the Messerschmitt 19 after gaining some more altitude and a bit more speed, but with a Fockel 490A4 coming up underneath us here and trying to head towards a stall, we're going to oblige and take them out of the sky completely. And this is where we come into the concept of short distance boom and zoom, in that the Spitfire Mark 5B does not do well over longer distances in the dive for three main reasons. Number one, its dive speed acceleration is average at best, up to 700 comments now, and beyond that point it drops off considerably and it's very difficult to get to a speed in excess of 800 comments now in a dive. Although your maximum dive speed is good at 924 km now, it will still be beaten by battery rate in opposition, such as the P51D5 and the C205 Series 3, but more importantly, it's very difficult to obtain at this maximum dive speed unless you start off your dive at an altitude of 7,000 meters and use war emergency power aggressively in a 90 degree dive. So instead, shorter distance boom and zoom is going to be the flavour of the day because the second reason, as you've just seen as we avoided the head-on with the P39K on Aerocobra, is that the roll rate of the Spitfire Mark 5B locks up between 550 and 700 km an hour and it will drop by 75%. And adding that to an already average roll rate means that it's very difficult to roll this plane when you go beyond the maximum point of that lock-up threshold. Unfortunately there, coming down the P39K, I believe our speed was no more than 650 km an hour, so as a result we still retained some of our roll rate and were anticipating the head-on so we could snap out of the way before the results grew catastrophic for our aircraft with a 37mm high explosive shell impacting us directly, and that gave us our second kill. The third and final reason is that the energy retention of the Mark 5B is not that strong as a whole, particularly in the vertical. In a boom and zoom dive, if you're going to return in climb angle of 30 degrees, you'll find that you only return to your original state before the dive over a 1,050 meter dive. So if you started off at 4,000 meters altitude and with a speed of 300 km an hour, you'd only be able to return to this position if you came out of the dive at 2,950 meters altitude. With war emergency power, you'll be kicking this threshold all the way up to 1,700 meters. But again, this exposes the fact that for you to conduct boom and zoom dives over longer distances successfully, you'll be dependent on war emergency power. And you can imagine if you suddenly get bounced by someone as you're coming out of your return climb and you've been using up all your war emergency power and you need it once again to give you the ability to stay in the fight against this aggressor, you've exhausted your war emergency power and will not have that resource available for a given period of time. 
and with the SP2C4 there just interjecting, you saw there the longer distance boom and zoom approach where we had to linearize the situation and pick on a foe who was not anticipating us latching onto them. Instead they were mid-turn, they are perhaps reacting to the turn fight ensuing around them, and instead we picked up the kill cleanly. And now diving down the Fockel 490A, which is attacking a friendly Spitfire. It's an A1. We're not able to get the cleanest of shots on the foe as we're building up our speed in the dive here. Even in a short distance boom and zoom, it's not always going to be 100% rewarding. And it means we damage their elevator. We're going to swing around to damage their rudder, but we only pick up the assist. Not to worry. So going back to the concept of the energy retention, we talked about it in the vertical and in the straight line, if you decide to go into a boom and zoom dive and then just straight line it away, you'll find that the straight line energy retention is slightly below average, coming at a point of 525 kilometers an hour. That's where your speed will start to hold. And again, the drop off in your speed, so if you come out of the dive at 750 kilometers an hour, is dramatic to the point that you'll be down to 600 kilometers an hour very quickly. And it's only then that you start to experience this retention factor coming in as you head down towards 525 kilometers an hour. But even then, a good number of foes will be able to outrun you when coming out of a boom and zoom dive. Either they're chasing you, or alternatively, if you're chasing after someone, it's going to prove frustrating if you cannot keep up with them. And that applies in a good number of cases. Now the upshot is, the only aspect of your energy retention that is strong is in terms of the horizontal. Now it's not that strong in terms of, by comparison with your batter rating adversaries, but it's stronger than the other components. In that, your energy retention in the horizontal is average at best, you'll gradually bleed your speed in a get dedicated turn with no flaps engaged, dropping down to 295 km an hour which is the holding point. Add in your landing flaps however and that's where the difficulty starts to come in. Because what you'll find is your landing flaps give you a very strong turning circle to the point that your turn circle practically rivals that of an A6 and 3 by the zeros that you'll see at a batter rating of 4.3 which has its combat flaps engaged. But to get this, you're going to be taking away your ability to retain your energy in the horizontal massively, all the way down to your stall speed of 100 km an hour, which is a fantastic stall speed, again, only better by the zeros that you're going to be encountering, and we saw an exhibition of it there against the bow fighter, which we climbed up towards. Now the downside is, of course, that you need to be wary of using your landing flaps too aggressively, because if you do, rather than using them sparingly, what you'll find is you'll be going towards the stall much sooner than you anticipated. Now on the plus side what you'll find is when you go into a stall your stall recovery is very fast. You'll level out very quickly and you only need to build up your speed to 170 km an hour before you're combat capable once again. So you pick up the double strike there on the hindcall 112 and then the Spitfire Mark 9 cutting through the furball. And now we're going to come out on the I-16 Type 27 here. We're going to plan to cut over the top of them, rolling over the top as they graze us with their 20mm cannon and we'll finish them off for our another kill. And cuts them apart and coming back to the concept of stall recovery, because there's very little penalty to you stalling out as such, what it means is you can make those aggressive nose up vertical plays against bombers that are overflying you, or heavy fighters that are overflying you and not reacting to your presence, or even some fighters who are just completely out of the picture, i.e. they're not focusing on what's happening directly below them. And it means you can combine this factor with your decent straight line acceleration as a whole, where you'll go from your stall speed to 350 km an hour at a good rate on engine power alone, if you add in more emergency power, you'll accelerate all the way up to 475 km an hour, extending this threshold massively at a very fast rate, again emphasizing the more emergency power dependency of this aircraft. And that means you can always get yourself back into your ideal speed range very quickly. And for reference, my experience, the ideal speed range of this plane, if you want its control surfaces performing at their maximum, is anywhere between 275 and 450 km an hour. And that's another key strong point of this plane. It has a massive ideal speed range, well suited for its turn fighting capabilities, and the occasional bit of boom and zoom in getting into that position to conduct the short distance boom and zoom strikes. So whereas a good number of planes will require you to build up a lot of speed to be ready to get into the fight, an example being the main battery rating adversary, the Messerschmitt 19 f 4 this plane will feel more comfortable in that it can quickly get into its ideal speed range and be ready to go once again. And as for your ideal altitude range, it's between 1,000 and 5,000 meters. That'd be my recommendation because all the way from ground level up to 5,000 meters altitude, you're going to have no penalty to your engine's performance. And in terms of the maximum altitude limits of 5,500 meters altitude, you'll find there's a gradual acceleration drop off and it starts here and becomes much more significant at 6,000 meters. And for every 100 meters gained beyond that point, you'll find the engine performance of this plane is penalized massively. And as for your control surfaces, you'll find at 6,500 meters, an additional heaviness is added to the elevator, which will widen the turn circle and make loops difficult unless you start them at 400 km an hour plus. Now coming onto the control surfaces within the ideal speed range, that's something we've neglected to talk about so far. Your roll rate, we mentioned it earlier, is average. And the issue with the roll rate is it's rather gradual compared to what you may perhaps want in a turn fighter in that it takes away your ability to quickly change up your direction on the fly. So you typically commit to turns and you follow them through. 
The upshot is that your rudder is strong and it gives you a very tight flat rudder turn circle only beaten by the zeros you're going to encounter and this is by a very small margin, do keep that in mind. Which means you can use flat rudder turns in order to beat your opponents rather than having to actually go into a standard turn. I roll the plane 90 degrees and then put it up on the elevator. And here again we're showing the stalling capabilities of this aircraft as we get some hits into the Junkers 88 and bring them down where she appears we've got the assist there. My apologies. The final aspect to consider is that the elevator of this plane is average in its overall response but it does have one downside that needs to be factored in and that is when you go into the vertical of the elevator so you conduct a loop it's a heavy control surface and what this means is your tight loop circle is undermined to a degree in that because your elevator becomes heavy and this causes your loop to be rather slow it means that the loop takes time and you cannot successfully use a loop in all cases to simply follow a foe or tighten your grip on their six. Instead, sometimes you'll find that foes will use loops in order to counteract your position in the sky and prey on the fact that because you have a slow loop in circle, despite it being tight, they can actually cause you to effectively hang there in the sky. And you'll want to start your loops at 300 km an hour plus, otherwise you're going to be at risk of stalling the plane out. And the final item tonight in terms of durability, you'll note that we only took a graze of 20mm cannon fire and our fuselage has pretty much gone fully yellow. Do keep in mind the wingtips of this plane are very fragile and have a high chance of snapping off when impacted with 20mm cannon shells. And on top of that, the engine seems to have a magnet inside it and wants to attract every single round to strike in it. And when the engine goes orange, you'll lose about 60% of its performance. If it goes red, you'll lose 80% of the performance and it'll very quickly go into a blackened state. But the game ends and it's time to take a look at the post-game stats. By using our Spitfire Mark 5B in a more of a defensive posture, either trying to reverse engagements as our opponents had the initiative and tried to attack us, or alternatively controlling a particular area of the sky, cleansing it of enemy bombers, or helping to secure our team's victory in a furball, we were able to pick up 7 kills and 2 assists, netting us 19,144 silver lines and 2,676 research points. When facing the Spitfire Mark 5B in a one-on-one -on -one engagement, I can recommend two approaches to defeating this aircraft. The first is to exploit its relatively slow nature through hit and run tactics. Whilst the climb rate of the Spitfire Mark 5B is good, its lack of overall sustainability allows a significant portion of its battery rate in opposition to at least match the rate at which the plane gains altitude, if not surpass it. Upon finding yourself on an equal altitude footing with the Mark 5B, you can then proceed to use your plane's superior speed to conduct a series of head-on passes with the aircraft especially if you have nose-mounted cannon armament, such as the case in the LA-5FN, the Meshtermit 19F4, and the Akovalev Yak-3. Or prefer to run your wing-mounted armament with a long-distance convergence setting of 600 meters or more, the example here being the P-51D5 Mustang. After each pass, you can use your superior speed to break away from the Mark 5B and prepare for the next pass, eventually bringing it down. However, it should be noted that this approach works on the assumption that the Mark 5B pilot is running a shorter gun convergence setting of 400 meters or less. The expansion of this approach will be to outcline the Mark 5B in the first instance for your superior and or more sustainable climb rate, the examples being the I-185, M82 or the C-205 Series 3, before using boom and zoom tacks to eliminate the Mark 5B from the skies. The second is to use the Mark 5B's poor roll rate in a high speed dive to your advantage. If you find the Mark 5B is on your 6 and you have the altitude available, go into a steep dive with the aim of building your speed to above 700km an hour. If the Mark 5B continues to pursue, they will be pursuing at the loss of 75% of their roll rate, meaning they will struggle to follow turning manoeuvres in such a dive. Planes which maintain the control surfaces well in high speed dives, for example the P-47D Thunderbolts and the G-55 Sotter Series 0, can use this against the Mark 5B by entering a descending spiral which the Mark 5B will struggle to follow, normally forcing their pilot to have to break off or overshoot. You can add to this through reversing the direction of the spiral mid-dive, adding to the difficulty experienced by the Mark 5B's pilot and giving you the chance to come out on their 6. To wrap up, let's first recap the strengths and weaknesses of the Spitfire Mark 5B. Its main strengths are Number 1. Turn fighting potential With its tight turn circle, especially with landing flats active, strong rudder and wide ideal speed range, the Mark 5B can rapidly turn the tables on those who get too close. This works especially well when fighting from a defensive position, reacting to an incoming opponent's aggression. Number 2. Ideal Acceleration Whilst the plane's overall acceleration powers compared to some of its opposition, it is strong enough to allow the Mark 5B to quickly reach its ideal speed range, preparing the plane's control surfaces for the next engagement. And number 3. Painless Stall With a great stall speed of 100km an hour and a very fast stall recovery procedure, manoeuvres based around stalling such as hammerheads can be used to the Mark 5B's advantage. 
Just be sure to monitor your usage of the plane's landing flaps so you do not stall earlier than you originally anticipated. As for its key weaknesses, number one, lacks the initiative. In its opposition normally being able to reach high top speeds and even match or surpass its climb rate, the Mark 5B can prove frustrating for those who like to initiate engagements. Instead, you'll find yourself typically having to react to an opponent's aggression, reversing the engagement to your advantage. And number two, average energy retention. The Mark 5B does not retain its energy well. This applies particularly in the vertical for boom and zoom, but also extends into the straight when chasing or running away from opponents following the dive. As for its average energy retention in the horizontal, this is undermined if the plane's landing flaps are used to tighten a turn. As for my final opinion of the aircraft, the Spitfire Mark 5B remains a capable turn fighter unlike the preceding iterations of the Spitfire family. With the removal of the Mark 5B Trops tropicalization kit, the Mark 5B gains a minor increase in performance in terms of straight line acceleration, top speed and climb rate. However, this makes little difference to the plane's performance versus its battery rating contemporaries, thereby maintaining the status quo. With that, that is all I've got time for today. For my next review in two weeks time, i.e. Sunday the 13th of January 2019, I intend to review either Number 1, the G55 Serie 1, the Tier 3 Battery Rating 4.7 Italian Fighter. Or number 2, the A6M3 Raisin Mod 22 Co, the Tier 3 Battery Rating 4.3 Japanese Fighter. Which of these two aircraft I review is entirely up to you. You can cast your vote by using the hyperlink in the description of this video. Polling will close at 1200 hours GMT on Sunday the 6th of January 2019. But as always, I've been TX141. If you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. And until next time, ladies and gentlemen, as always, take care and good luck in the skies.